Welcome to episode 13 of the Wreck of Stoke Podcast. I'm your host, John Champion. Remember, you can find this show on Apple, Google, Stitcher, also SoundCloud and YouTube, and so many other great sites. Make sure you listen, like, and subscribe. Tell your friends. Now on this episode, we're going to talk about what people are doing to continue to create change after so much social unrest in America. Also, I'll interview a friend of mine who's living in Ukraine and talk about his take on uh, seeing America go through so much change during the global pandemic and the social unrest. Our conversation is uncomfortable at times, funny, and very necessary. In the music section... I've got a great new song you're sure to love. I'll tell you all about it. Remember, you can find links to topics, organizations, and songs we discuss in the show description. Thanks for listening. Now on with the show. Welcome back to the Wreck of Stowe podcast. So the question is asked, what's next? What are people doing with all this energy and interest and enthusiasm after the protests following the murder of George Floyd. Well, the calls for change in many areas haven't really ended. There are several groups in Raleigh, North Carolina. One I stumbled upon online has a survey, and I watched a really exciting and informative Zoom meeting. Very sharp young people. They're in a group called the Refund Raleigh Freedom Committee. The Zoom video uh, really covers the history of police violence and carves out exactly what the group is demanding. A lot of the same things they're talking about are, I go back to, um, I've referenced the movie 13th, uh, the Ava DuVernay film. Uh, a lot of the things they discuss uh, are topics that she touched on in her movie. It's a film you should really see. Uh, they make some really great points about defunding police departments and so much more. They really spell out what it looks like and, you know, explain that, you know, it's not going to be the type of thing where you don't get help in the situation. There's a survey um, that they've put out, and I've got a link to it in the show description. Also, They make some great points about gentrification in the Raleigh area, the overall purpose of policing, what it was designed for, and um, also there's some other organizations you should look into supporting. Uh, One is the Fertile Ground Food Cooperative. Another is Raleigh Pact, P-A-C-T. Now, they've worked really hard to get an oversight review board created in the community that has the power to investigate, subpoena, and discipline police. Again, good links in the show description. Make sure you check it out. And after you check out those links, share them with somebody. We'll be back with more with our interview right after this. You're listening to the Wreck of Stowe podcast. I'm John Champion, and I'm talking with a longtime friend and co-conspirator. This guy put me on so many stages in the Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill area back in 2004 and well beyond. I've done so much crazy stuff with this guy from party buses to charity fundraisers to hanging out with midgets, six kids, then strippers, sometimes all on the same night. Kevin Garofalo, how are you doing, my friend? Hey, I'm doing all right, man. Hey, can I right. be excited about this? Can I, can I be your hype man or what? That's pretty good. I mean, you were always the hype man, man. Whenever, uh, whenever you're emceeing, I love you it. had that I magic energy. It. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And unlike Rick James would say, cocaine's a hell of a drug, but I didn't need any. It was great. I know. It was great. It's all right? There you go. So where where are you, Kevin? I am in Ukraine right now. I've been here since February 29th. Oh, all right, man. And what what are you doing over there? I I, I know it's got to be a great story. Well, no, so I've got two employees over here. I, I own a small web design company now. 
Um, uh-huh. And I come out here because, you know, I, I don't love the idea of just outsourcing. So these are actually people who I've trained who are my friends. They do some of the yeah. front end design for me. And mm-hmm. it's important for me to come out here once or twice a year for about, you know, two weeks to a month each time. And I landed here, and about a week later, everything mm-hmm. shut down. Not well, just here, yeah. in the whole world, you know? The whole fucking world, yeah. So, um, you know, the flight stopped. They, they were supposed to have started again on June 15th, but they didn't. And I think right. that some have started flying now, but I can buy plane tickets. But the thing is that you know, maybe they're selling 10 tickets or something on a certain day. Ooh. And only one or two flights might actually leave. Wow. Man. Now, as far as flying back into the U.S., uh, if you if you get a flight, can you even come back? Or are we on their no, 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 no list? Well, I can come back. Um, yeah. <laughs> frankly, why do I want to? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy as hell here. It is crazy as hell. It's getting crazier by the day. Numbers are going up. People won't wear masks. Uh, uh, there's a guy that lives on Pennsylvania Avenue. That yeah, it's it's crazy. It's you crazy. See, here, there's been kind of a different different response, which is which has been interesting. Um, here, as soon as they started the quarantine. They said basically they were going to start limiting people on the metro and on the buses. Like you couldn't have more than 10 people on a bus. Masks mm-hmm. were required everywhere. And this was in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is after like 400 cases were found in Ukraine. So it was just mm-hmm. at 400 cases and they just shut things down. And the next day they said, you know what? Screw it. And they shut down the metro and they shut mm-hmm. down the buses entirely. So... You know, I, I wonder why New York didn't do that. Like, right. hey, we've got this rapidly transmissible disease. Let's keep the subways <laughs> open. That seems like it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. The dirtiest underground. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. And, yeah. and here, everybody hates the mask laws. They hate it. They're, they're bitching and they're complaining about it. But they're all following mm-hmm. the rules. Right. Man. It's, it's, it's nothing crazy. like... You know what I'm reading about in the states, and it's weird because I'm an American who's seeing this this tragedy happen through the mm-hmm. lens of news, right? Yeah. And what of do you course, think? You know, well, so I have to go to like three or four different news sites. I mm-hmm. I don't love just going to CNN. Um, yeah. They they used to be my go to for news, but lately everything's become sort of an editorial. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and then you go to Fox News, and it's like also an editorial just written the other way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so I, I'm I'm reading all of this stuff, and you know, the the most accurate information I'm getting, I guess, is from talking to friends back home. But right. I understand right. some people just don't want to wear masks. Yeah, man. There, there's a whole movement of people here in North Carolina that uh, I think today, as a matter of fact, their plan is to. Uh, protest downtown and maskless, of course, then um, go to the uh, legislative building and demand that the governor be impeached because he is uh, hindering the economy, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I, I, I just, I'm like, just wear the mask. Just wear the I don't, mask. I don't like wearing condoms either, but you do it. Yeah, you got to do it or else, you know, the, you, <laughs> your procreator, you catch it. Uh, Disease, imagine. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's. Uh, well, the thing is, it's such a small thing. You know, it's not like wearing a mask is, is like that. Like usually, what happens is I put the mask on, and, and then after about ten minutes, I forget that it's on. Yeah, yeah. It's, it. it's not that hard. And the and the big thing is, you know, if even if you don't have symptoms, you could have it and make somebody else sick. You know. So that's what people should, but you know, people here are big on you can't tell me what to do. Yeah, you, know, you right. can't tell me what to do. You know, I know. Like we've got a country that's acting like a five-year-old child that, you know, doesn't want to eat his dinner. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, you can't go tell them to stand in the corner because that's abuse. It's it's just nuts, man. It's nuts. 
So what's it like in Ukraine when things are good? Um, so, I mean, it's like, I love Ukraine. Ukraine is an amazing country. If you haven't been here before, you should. The vegetables <laughs> actually taste like vegetables. Wow. Um, you know, like I remember when I was young and I'm 40 now, I remember when I was like six or seven going to my grandmother's house and she would have these tomatoes that she grew in her garden that were just like amazing. And then, mm-hmm. you know, you go out and you start buying your tomatoes in the supermarket. You start like eating tomatoes on sandwiches from like Subway or not even Subway, but Jersey Mike's or, or one of these other sub chains. And, and they, they sort of have that sort of tomato flavor, but over the years, it's just been more and more watered down. And then you come here and you taste tomato. And it's like, oh man, like, it's man. like you could eat it like an apple almost. It's delicious. So the food here is really good. The drinks are super cheap. Mm. If you're a drinker, you can go out to a bar and get wasted on like 20 bucks. And like you can mm. friend probably too. You can go down mm. to the store and buy a bottle of vodka, like I guess a, a fifth. Mm. Um, let's see what it is. It is... Do, 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 do. Half a liter. A half a liter is about two dollars and fifty cents. Mm. And it's Ukrainian Man. vodka. It's good. I know that's uh, right. Nightlife here is interesting. There's a lot of there's a lot of karaoke, so you know I'm eating that up. But I know that's right. They I only they only know a few American songs. Like everybody wants you to play Bon Jovi's "It's My Life." And I hate that. I'm not so good at singing it either. Uh, they, they want that one. Uh, you know, Green Day. What's the most popular Green Day? If you think of Green Day, what, what's the most popular song you think of? Uh, let's see. What's it? That Wake Me Up Before Tomorrow Comes. That one. Is that the one most popular Green Day song? I would have said no, no, Basket no. Case or, or maybe Time of Your Life. Time of Your Life for sure. Yep. But Time here, everybody wants Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Oh, and, they okay. and it's all right. Like, you know, I, I introduced them to some music, but I'm, you know, my, sure my music that. are eclectic as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, have you hit them with? I believe in a thing called love. Absolutely, but I can't hit the high notes so well anymore. I understand. This One of those changed. things that you get older, your testicles descend further and further. Soon they'll be at my knees. I understand. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Well, I know you are thrilling them in karaoke spots left and right. What's uh, what's the comedy scene like? Do you do any stand-up? You know, oddly, about a week before the quarantine started, I was invited to do stand-up comedy in English. And I was, I've was i never had that opportunity here before. Mm-hmm. And they were doing an all, all-American stand-up show. Man. And um, I was ready to go, and then quarantine hit. But it's weird over here, too, because our humor really doesn't translate. Really? Really. <laughs> like, the things well, we find... Like, for the most part, there are some things that that do. Are you familiar with the uh, Charlie the Unicorn on YouTube? No, I'm not. It's a stupid YouTube video. Here, they love it. And <laughs> in the States, it's, like, mid-tier. Um, you know, it's just it's a different... It's a different thing altogether. But the right. one thing I've been getting questions about here all the time has been about what the Black Lives Matter movement is, is about. They have no concept of this at right. all here. Not a lot of black folks in the Ukraine, I get it. Well, there are, but they're uh-huh. all straight up from Africa. And, and when I say a lot, I've seen about 20 or 30 black people and there's, uh-huh. you know, a city of 7 million. Right, right. But it's weird here when I see a black person, I feel sort of more at home. Uh-huh. It's like, cause I know that this person is not from Ukraine and I automatically go up to him and I'm like, hey, what's going on? You know, expecting yeah. them to speak English. And mm-hmm. about 90% do, but like none of them, none of them are, I guess, African-American. They're all just like from Africa. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, and and here the n-word flies a lot but not in a bad way like hmm. here that's like the cool way to refer to a black person and so they think that they're being cool and the black people don't seem to mind at all because i don't know it's just i guess it's about context right 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can definitely be context. And like you said, there's no there's no reference to, you know, they're in Ukraine, so they don't they don't automatically think about, you know, this was a hateful, hurtful term because they don't they don't have any, you know, connection to black people in the South. You know? Right. It's funny, like so I grew up in Singapore and in Japan. Like that's where I spent my childhood. And I remember um I went to the American school in Singapore and we took a trip like every year there was this interim semester where uh, 20 kids would go on different trips. So every kid could go on a trip. It was paid for by the, the school or the businesses. It was private school, so it was really expensive. But you got to go to one of a number of different countries. And I went to uh, Vienna and Budapest in my senior year and there's a black guy on the trip with us. And when we landed in Hungary, which isn't that far away from Ukraine, mm-hmm. they had never, like, it was like people had never seen a black person before. And they all were going up to him like, oh, my God, do you know Michael Jordan? Do you know Michael Jackson? Because <laughs> we really, like, thought that this person knew Michael Jordan and Michael Jackson. And <clears throat> it was kind of like a cool novelty. Okay. Um, but, you know, here it's, it's still got that similar sort of feeling. Like, it's right. cool, like... You know, all the cool rappers are black, and, and they want that. But I get asked a lot of questions like, why why are they killing black people in America? Wow. And yeah, it's a... I don't know. I don't know what to tell them. Yeah. It, it's nuts here, man. Uh, I tell people to watch the movie uh, 13th by uh, Ava DuVernay. Uh, it, it's wild. I've, I've spent some time overseas when I was in the military. Uh, like I said, went to um, Far East, uh, ships four deployed out of Singapore, and I had similar, you know, this was 92 to about 95, and, and I can I can relate. Now, I if you can imagine me with the round Spike Lee glasses and baseball hat, you know, well, all I ever got was, <laughs> exactly, you know, somebody wants you to come in their shop, hey, Spike Lee, I give you a good deal, hey, you know, and... I remember being upset about it, you know, that I or that I'd meet women in a club and their only point of reference was, you know, the only black people they knew or saw were rappers. Yeah, and this happened to me in Japan. Um, I always tell people in Japan, it's a trip to me how, you know, Japanese girls are totally if if Japanese girls are into black guys and rappers they're a hundred percent in they're taking tannin pills they're going to rap clubs they're posing with pistols but then on the other side if they're into white guys and cowboy culture japanese girls 10 gallon hats doing the two-step and i mean and they think you know they think every white guy's garth brooks they think every black guy is you know the latest rap star and it's a it's a trip to me you know like to to be overseas and see the of uh, the effect of american media worldwide you know what i mean yeah but you know so what does that say about like if, if people idolize like the black rappers and movie stars and everything overseas right mm-hmm. <clears throat> what does that say about how america then is portraying black people in the yeah. media like i yeah. think that that shines pretty good but then like you read all this stuff saying oh you know don't go watch this movie or that movie because it's like racist mm-hmm. even though there are black people and, like i saw something the other day about like how the help doesn't further the black lives matter cause man yeah it's uh it's wild it's wild if uh i said watch that movie i've been telling people watch that movie 13th in uh the big thing about it, excuse me, the big thing about it is it's talking about how slavery pretty much never ended in America. And um, it goes it goes all the way back to the film Birth of a Nation. And it's like, you know, it's like, okay, slavery's over, but we still need these people to work. So, you know, we're going to arrest them for minor offenses and, you know, make them out to be, you know, horrible human beings that'll terrorize you and rip you from limb to limb so then they make this movie birth of a nation 
and it just you know it's just over the top with the black men are savages thing and there's just so many other examples it's like it just never it just never ended you know well, birth of a nation to the war on drugs to yeah it's a it, it it bothered me when i was overseas and i would be like but wait <laughs> you know they're smart black people they're nice black people you know those guys rapping about this stuff are actors you know but you know it's what yeah. about movies like boys in the hood the boys in the hood's a great film great i, do, film. I think and see, i i saw that growing up in like it, it made me like think that gangsters were a little bit cool, but it also made me see like, oh, this is why people get into being gangsters. And I know that that's mm-hmm. you know not exactly the real portrayal of it, but like this is how you get out of it. This is like this is what it was. So I, I mean, I remember seeing like really poignant movies too. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, one of my favorite Civil War movies of all time is Glory. Oh, Glory! Yeah, it's a great film. It was it was amazing, and you know it. It kind of hammers home the, the the whole point. Like, I mean, whoever can look at the Confederate flag at this day and age and say, "Okay, you know, this isn't a symbol of slavery," is stupid. There you go. There you but, go. It, it it meant something. It was it was a taunt. You know, it's like we lost the war, but you know, back home we're gonna praise the exactly. It was, and I don't get I don't taunt. get why in the military anybody would support this. Like they were the only country in the world that almost brought America to their knees. Yeah. Why are we flying their flag? It's like, you know, I'm sure there were plenty of Germans who had who had you know ancestors that were Nazis. They don't hot like they don't fly that flag proudly. They're like super ashamed of it. Yeah, it's it's wild. It's uh, like I said the uh, whole it's heritage, not hate thing. But what if your heritage is fucked up? <laughs> I mean, when do you you know when do you accept? Okay, you know these people before me were wrong. It's there's a whole lot of re-education that should happen, but I don't think it'll ever happen, especially not with my opinion you know current leadership that america has uh we have, just we have current leadership <laughs> yeah would you believe right uh yeah i stretch to call it that yeah it just but, you know, he's kind of know, feeding I'm, kind of feeding the fire of you know those brown people are bad and it's it's um it's bad because it, it opens up this entire cauldron of well if he can say it I've been wanting to say it. Hell, I'm going to say it to whoever I want. You know. And but that, I've got a question for you. Like, what, what, here's what's bothering me the most about it is comedy. Mm-hmm. Like, this has impacted comedy a lot. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, for me, I've always looked at comedy as a way of making people laugh at difficult things, but still getting them to think about it right yeah so do you remember the jokes that i told about like black jesus and white santa yeah yeah um you know so do you mind if i tell them for the please please, for please the listener so please, right, was, please so first of all like one of the first times i told these jokes um <laughs> it was at the richard Pryor tribute show Okay. Uh, if in, you remember that. Yeah, I remember uh, that. I remember at that. The treehouse or something. I was the only white comedian performing. And um, I got up and said, I was talking about how I, I'm really sick of, uh, of everybody having this, this picture of, of Jesus, right? And he's always white because clearly the people who are defending the notion of him being white are the same people who want to, you know, nuke the Middle East in general. Right, mm-hmm. never the white person that was from the Middle East ever in the entire history. But there's other proof as well, you know. He was mm-hmm. poor, <laughs> you know, and I mean he couldn't swim; he had to walk on water. So that's how you know Jesus was black, right? That, I um, remember this too. And then you know I, I go into uh, to the you know at the same time it's impossible to have a black Santa Claus, and I don't mean offense by that, but he's from Scandinavia. There's never ever been a black person. That's like coming from Scandinavia before. 
But also, you know, kids, we already ask them to believe, like, the most ridiculous thing. There's this man who can, like, fly around in one night, 36 hours if you consider time change, right? And drop mm -hmm. off presents to millions and millions of people. And given what's happening in America with, like, Eric Garner and Michael Brown and now George Floyd, do you really think that there's a black man who could break into millions of homes and not at least get stopped by the police? I do okay. remember that joke. I do. I do. Yeah. After the show, Mm -hmm. A white girl came up to me and said, your racist jokes don't fly. You can't make fun of colored people like that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and the thing is, you not making fun of black people. You know, now it's so hard to say anything. You know, right. um, yeah, you couldn't you couldn't tell those jokes now. That's for damn sure. Um, and everyone, want to. yeah, everyone is on this, you know, let me expose someone who's wrong. See, I found someone who's wrong. Let me get them canceled. Let me get them ruined, you know, and no one like, uh, perfect example, just like you're talking about like blazing saddles. I see there's this big move to cancel blazing saddles because, you know, it's a satire of racism written by Mel Brooks and Richard Pryor, you know, and Richard Pryor has said in interviews I've read, you want to make racists look like jerks, but there are people who, you know, maybe they only see a little bit of the movie and they see clan imagery. So automatically we got to cancel. All right. And, I mean, yeah, it's like Huckleberry it, Finn. Mm hmm. They tried to cancel Huckleberry Finn. This was years ago. It uses the N-word something like a thousand times. Mm -hmm. Because one of the characters' name is N-word Jim, right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But if you look at it, at the time that it was written, I'm not saying that racism was ever okay, but what I am saying is at the time it was written, no white protagonist in a book was going to have a best friend that was black. Right. Moreover, Huckleberry Finn was kind of a moron, and, and Jim bailed him out. Like, he <laughs> was the responsible one. <laughs> yeah. In this yeah. time when it wasn't okay to be friends with black people, this kid's best friend was a black guy who was way more responsible than him. If anything, that's the opposite of racist. Because it's not about the word that was used. It's about it's okay to be friends with black people and they might be better than you. <laughs> like yeah. and that's okay. You know, yeah. It's there's a whole lot of there's a whole lot of anger and hurt there's, some, there's a lot of confusion here in the states because when you say black lives matter you know especially in the sense of you know uh law enforcement please stop killing me my life matters you know there's still a lot of people that don't get it and they want to say well all lives matter well, so and hold they, on they, i, I want to say that i'm a fan of the idea of all lives matter in general i, I do believe that all lives matter but when people won't say that Black Lives Matter, I ask them to break down the equation for me of what is the equation for All Lives Matter. Well, the equation is white lives matter, black lives matter, brown lives matter, red lives matter, blue lives matter, all lives matter. But one of those pieces of that equation of All Lives Matter is Black Lives Matter. Why can't you say that? Why is it so hard for you to say that? And like I said, it, there's there has to be a, a re-education because people think if you say black lives matter you're saying it's okay to destroy property or you're, you're saying it's okay to you know have sex with my daughter you know they they, they just take it the wrong way and you know that's, that's that's not you know the whole the whole purpose is you know black lives matter just as much as white lives you know our lives are equal and our lives matter too um, and by saying white lives no matter, matter. <laughs> by, by saying white lives matter, it's kind of like this is the example I've, I've used. It's like say you had a child and your child died, and you're giving the eulogy, and you're talking about how much you love your child and how much your child meant to you, and all of a sudden, Karen from North Raleigh steps in front of the microphone and says, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, but white lives are important too." That's that's how white lives matter feels. <laughs> that's how or so all lives. Wanna, 
Like I, I um, th- there was a lot of people that were getting canceled, even you know, two, three, four, five years ago, mm-hmm. over blackface, right? Mm-hmm. And and one of them stood out to me. There was this actress who dressed up as Crazy Eyes from Orange Is the New Black. They were doing an Orange Is the New Black mm-hmm. thing. I don't know who this actress was or whatever, but she darkened her skin. You can call it blackface for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that she could be more like Crazy Eyes. And and the purpose was she loved this actress so much and she loved this character so much that she wanted to do the best possible portrayal of it, right? Mm-hmm. And I said, why is that a bad thing that she wants to emulate somebody who's black, right? Why is that bad? And somebody says, well, you don't understand historical context. Believe me, I understand the historical context, right? And and blackface wasn't mm-hmm. usually a good thing in my mind but uh, I asked the question about okay let's say that there's a little girl for Halloween and she wants to dress up like Michelle Obama and she's a white girl the difference between Michelle Obama and, and Hillary Clinton is a little four year old girl is the color of your skin right but now we're telling this little girl you can't dress up like Michelle Obama and put on blackface because it's racist but really the little girl all she knows is she wants to be just like Michelle Obama and we're telling somebody it's not okay. And now she's starting to see, oh, there's a difference between white people and black people. And it's not okay to do some things and and we should, you know, not do this, right? And I said, in that case, is it a bad thing? And, and the person who I was talking to told me to shut up, that it was my white privilege speaking, and that I just didn't understand anything. And basically that because I wasn't a black person, I have no... I should have no opinion in, in, in the matter, which whenever anybody starts to feel marginalized and not counted and not heard and, and are being told that they're going to be marginalized and not counted and not heard, it's a scary and disenfranchising thing. Don't get me wrong. This has happened to black people in America for 250 years and it's not right, but it's not right the other way either. They, they talk about a discussion and we need to be able to talk about these things but when somebody doesn't agree with your points of look at the historical context I've looked at the historical context but this isn't in the historical context right have a better discussion with me and don't just tell me to shut up right 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 yeah I think uh, for a lot of people a lot of people a lot of black people kind of feel like by this point in time we shouldn't have to say things like don't wear blackface don't call me by you know an animal moniker you know so it's it's frustrating it's very frustrating it's like we have to every couple of years you know i feel like i have to do uh you know a social media post okay this is okay this is not okay this is okay this is not okay. This is why I, I had people, I'll, I'll give you an example, you know, so the NFL is going to play the uh, Negro national anthem before the first game, if there's ever a first game. And okay. there were people making posts like, you know, now why is there a Negro national anthem? Why did they have a Negro national? Anthem? What, what was the purpose of that? And it's like, okay, do we need to go? <laughs> Do you? Why would you not know? People that don't understand why they're historically black colleges and universities, and and it does it does reek of privilege. It's like it's not like it's not like black people said, hmm, you know, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill is pretty cool, but I'm gonna start my own college. No, that's not why it was done. <laughs> it was done because they wouldn't let us go to school with you. You, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it, there are people who just get tired of having to re-explain the anger, hurt, and disappointment that black people go through day to day. You follow me? So wouldn't it be great, John, if we could get to a point where, and, and and for sure right now, this is not the time, right? There, right? There's also a time and a place for everything. So like you said, those jokes that I tell, I shouldn't tell them right now. And and you're right. 
because it's too raw. And for me in comedy, that kind of sucks because because I, I don't think you should ever be too raw. But wouldn't it be great if there was a point in time where where it was okay for white people to want to be black people, right? To to look up to those people. And I guess like another example would be I was out one day with two white girls and a rap song came on and it used the N-word in it. And one of the girls didn't say the word and the other girl did. And the girl who didn't say the word got so angry at the girl who did say the word. And she said, a white person should never say this, right? Mm-hmm. And okay, I, I, I agree. A little bit, kind of. But she's, wait a second, no, I'm singing, she's singing this song that was written by a black person. And she knows all the words to this song. So like, she appreciates the culture. She appreciates this artist so much so that she's learned all the words. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At the same time, like, I don't know this song at all because in general, for the most part, rap has just never really appealed to me. Neither does most top 40 stuff either. And neither does, you know, like I, I like, I have kind of a weird taste in music. I'm sure you've seen my karaoke. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awesome, it's awesome. <laughs> but, you know, like, so what's the answer there? Should somebody sing the word or not sing the word? Is it is it worse to become, you know, to, to always have to be conscious about something Rather than put it in the back of your mind, like, you know, there's no difference, right? Right now, the time isn't there. Like, right now, we should all tread lightly because we need to. But, I don't know, I guess that there should come a point that, like, we're not forced to think of people as different. You know, I see where you, I see what you're saying. (laughs) And uh, yeah, now now isn't the time, and it and it's difficult. It's very difficult, and I guess the thing I'd say in that situation is, I'd say like we're like we're looking at white people being forced to tread lightly, and you just have to say, okay, well, black people have been forced to tread lightly for two hundred fifty plus years, so you know it's just, it's it's tough. It's tough. It's tough to be so compassionate so aware and alert all the time and a lot of people just won't do it you know (laughs) a lot of people just you know they're they're i get the vibe of okay i've had enough of this when are we going to go back to and when you think about it kevin you're, you're not you're not here stateside i'll tell you this for sure if people hadn't been locked down if people hadn't been in their house with nothing to do you know I don't think the the murder of George Floyd would have affected people as much. It's like now it's like it was in their face all the time. I think it would have, right? You know, you look at you look at what happened with Michael Brown, Mm -hmm. and and there was a point in there that there was a struggle, right? And -hmm. enough people were able to say, "Eh, he probably shouldn't have struggled. He probably like." I can kind of maybe see it from the cop's point of view, even though probably the cop was wrong. There's this plausible deniability. In the George Floyd case, and the same thing with Eric Garner, too, like, pure and simple, like, that was murder. Like, there was no, there is no reason for that to have happened at all. And I think what really struck home to everybody about this case was that it went on for over eight minutes. And after five minutes, he was already passed out like Mm -hmm. what kind of monster do you have to be when somebody is passed out to continue to kneel on them and and there is not a single white person in this world who can look at that and say that what the cop did was defensible exactly exactly i think people's lives paused for this three months this lockdown and it gave people the time to pay attention to what happened, you know, while otherwise it would have just been another story in the news cycle that people heard a little bit about. But yeah, I mean, this was this was everywhere, and people were at home and in the house and afraid to go out and couldn't go to bars and couldn't go to movies, so they saw it everywhere, over and over, and you know, and it it, it made people more aware of the things that continue to happen to black people at the hands of law enforcement but yeah i that's just my belief i think 
that if people hadn't been on this this lockdown, you know, brought that out front. Now I'd really like to see, you know, police reform and some things happen, you know, from from all this energy. I'm just my fear is here in the States is that all that energy, all that protesting, it's just going to be forgotten. You know, it's like, oh, you know, people are going to let it all simmer down and nothing's going to happen. Until the next person gets choked out for eight, nine, ten minutes. I don't think I don't think it's going to simmer down, and I don't think it should. I think I think that there needs to be some real reform made. I like, you know, at first the idea of defunding the police was kind of like sketchy to me until I realized and studied more about what it meant, and it it, it just makes good sense. Like yeah. the amount that we spend on police, like. You know, there, there's there's a lot of laws that are out there that are just stupid, first of all. Like, second of all, like, so for instance, like the, the DUI law. I have a way that we get rid of DUIs immediately. 100%, not 100%, but like 99% of DUIs would be gone. You stick an interlock device in every single car. Right. And guess what? <laughs> when you do that, there won't be any more DUIs because your car doesn't start if you're right. drunk. Even if you're on the line, you think you could drive, right? But instead what we do is we have these these laws in place that don't actually stop people from dying. Mm -hmm. All it does is it's like able to punish the person who did it, which is great, but why not stop the problem, right? Get rid of a bunch of cops that way. Open up some money for substance abuse, you know? Like substance abuse counseling, like real substance abuse counseling. Give people an opportunity to go somewhere, to speak to some people. Yeah, you know, and, and put it in in the super lower class neighborhoods, right? That's where it's needed the most. You know, when you go to these rich neighborhoods that have all these like great rehab and counseling centers, sorry, those rich people they don't need it. They already have the the access to those things if they need it. They can buy their way into anything, right? The places that need these counseling centers the good ones it's it's in the lower socioeconomic places right right it's in the places where 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 kids see that it's easier to be a drug dealer and make money than to to work a minimum wage job and never get anywhere (laughs) and yeah so i mean defunding the police would would be great i think that's going to start to happen right? right there's no way that trump gets elected again like I, I, I can't, I can't see how that would possibly happen, right? And I think that Joe Biden's going to put some of this, you know, in play. Man, we shall see. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that Kanye doesn't steal too many votes. <laughs> this is, yeah, I but don't Kanye know and Trump are on the same ticket, probably. <laughs> I mean, those guys love each other. It's it's insane. It's insane. It's you know. And I was joking about it years ago. You know, I said, you know, well, who who's next? You know, Kanye, The Rock. You know, I mean, Why I can't really. Be Oprah. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready for a. Uh, I'm ready for a really boring non-celebrity president, but I'm not quite ready to vote libertarian. Yeah, I'm just, I just, I just, you know, I need a librarian. I need someone really boring who, you know, that's what we need. But yeah, you know, yeah, I don't know. So it's it's crazy good. here. And you've got a lot of great thoughts. You're listening to the Recosto podcast. I'm talking with Kevin Garofalo and he is in Ukraine. And uh, you are still as smart and as funny as ever. And I'm so glad to hear from you. I'm glad you are safe. And um, man, when you get back, yeah, we're gonna have to yeah, do this yeah. again. And, I'm gonna try uh, to claim refugee status. <laughs> I understand. I love it. I love it. You're gonna. Hey, you, you need your own show too. Exactly, if, because you've got a lot to say. If I could, if I could put one thing out there to your listeners, right? Please. Right now, there's a lot of like people who are just knee-jerk reactions right to everything Mm -hmm. there are people who you know are clearly belligerent and you're never gonna you're never gonna be able to talk to them and understand them 
but there are also like a majority of the people somewhere in the middle and everybody's kind of scared and on edge right when you get into a tense situation where you're having this this feeling talk to the person get some context from the person get them get them to see a little bit about your side without being rude just explain to them right and and a lot of these people who are kind of in the middle listen to their point of view as well even if you think it is wrong they're allowed to have a point of view but you can change it by letting them feel heard i think that's the most important thing that i can say is is let people feel heard then right. show them that they're wrong without being a dick about it <laughs> yeah 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 the, the love wins and kindness wins but yeah there's a whole lot of anger and animosity on both sides so yeah let's uh let's uh let's think before we speak and you know pray for good actions for sure man hey i love you bro thank you for having me on and uh i hope we get to do this again man i love you you be safe thanks so much for listening supporting and uh we're gonna talk more all right buddy have a good one all right be safe out there kevin We're back on the Wreck of Snow podcast. Now, some of my favorite musicians have come together and created a kick-ass song. Now, if you know me, I love live music, real music, instruments, horns galore. One of my favorite bands to see live is The Time. I've seen them several times. That awesome blend of funk, rock, and soul just a really talented band of brothers. Well, they there's a new song out. Jelly Bean Johnson, longtime drummer for the band and also a fantastic producer and guitarist, has a new song and he's got some great people along with him. Now, like I said, Jelly Bean's awesome. Remember Black Cat by Janet Jackson? Jelly Bean all day. Uh, produced it, guitar, he's awesome. Uh, he's legendary. He's also brought along with him legendary time keyboardist Monty Moore. That's right. They're together again. Monty is a badass. Besides all the time and Minnesota classic jams that he's known for, you know the first side of Alexander O'Neill's debut album? Uh, it's Monty, written and produced. That's it. Including... That slow jam of all slow jams, if you were here tonight. That's right. All right, I'm going to have all links to all this stuff now in the show description, so you'll see why that's a really hot song. Pleasure Principle as well. Monty Moore with Janet Jackson's Pleasure Principle and Work by Rihanna. See, I'm telling you, these guys are no joke. It doesn't stop there. Legendary new power generation rapper, dancer extraordinaire, Tony M is on the track. Now you'll recognize his awesome voice and style from songs like Get Off with Prince and the NPG, Willing and Able from the Diamonds and Pearl album, and another great song, Together. But it doesn't end there. Man, I'm telling you, I'm putting this is a super group, I'm telling you. Vocals by one of the most talented people. Actually, he's also known as the most talented kid in the biz. Leader of the Planet 12 movement. I'm talking about Law. This brother's worked with everyone. Part of the P-Funk family. Uh, chopped it up with Amy Winehouse. Big time. Well respected. And loved by everyone from New Edition to Lionel Richie. This guy knows his way around instruments, music, production. So, I'm saying he's a bad dude. So much musical knowledge. So this is a great thing. We're taking a student of the Minneapolis Sound straight out of Brooklyn and teaming him up with his music idols. It's a beautiful thing. The song is called She Can Get It. I've got a link to it in the show description so you can listen to it right now. I'm telling you, it's a great song, and I can hear all the great influences. Prince, Hendrix, Sly, James Brown, MJ, 
The song will be on Jelly Bean Johnson's soon-to-be-released album, Get Experienced. Find it and more great stuff in the show description. We'll be back after this. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Wreck of Stoke podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for your support. You can find the show about anywhere podcasts are played. Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, and so many more places. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Click the PayPal link to support the show. It's all so appreciated. Thanks for checking out the Recosto Podcast.